Hi, Paul Thompson here from Spitfire Audio. This is an inline quick tip. So you can watch the tip on the screen, but you can also download the logic file linked below and follow through in your own studio if you want to. There are two basic things that we're going to look at in this tip video. One is the microphone positions in Albion One and two is the controllers. So let's start with our microphones. As you can see, it opens up in Easy Mix, and if I click on this spanner, then we'll see these microphones. Now I'm going to use my fader controller here so that the MIDI data goes into the session and you will see exactly what I'm doing as well. So the first thing that loads up is the Decca Tree mics, a set of three mics placed just behind the conductor and a little bit higher up above the conductor's head. And that sounds like this. Now, as you can hear, you can hear the instrument very clearly, nice and crisp, but you also get the sense of the, the sound stage and of the room and all that kind of stuff. What else is available? Well, if I use my fader to pull down and switch off the T mic, and then I put the C mic up, that sounds like this. Now you can hear there um, that the close mics are very much drier sounding, still a tiny bit of the room in the background, but also they give you a slightly wider feel of the stereo spread. What's the next mic that we'd look at? I would tend to think of the outriggers next, which are at the same height as the tree, but further out. And then finally, the ambient mics, which are the most distant mics in the set. So usually I'd probably make my own little balance. Um, I'd probably have maybe the tree and the outriggers set. Let's turn the ambience off. Something like this. But if I vary the amount of close mic in the signal, just listen. You can hear it really changes the sound of the overall picture that you're getting. Now I'm going to keep the same mix uh, up with the long strings and we're going to look at the controllers. But just first of all, uh, have a listen to that sound. So it's a nice classic sound. We can hear a little bit of the close mics in there giving us a little bit of the texture, um, but the tree and the outrigger is giving us the wider sound stage. Now you can see that I have uh, three controllers here. I've got expression, dynamics, and vibrato. And the expression is really just an overall volume control. As you can hear, the volume really is the only thing that's changing. You're not the the uh, intensity of the sound, the kind of dynamic of the sound isn't really changing. It's just getting a bit quieter. Now, conversely, if I use the dynamic controller, listen to the difference. So as you can hear there, the intensity of the sound is now changing. It's a completely different thing. Yes, the volume's changing as well, but the dynamic, the players are playing at a quieter dynamic when we use this controller. So it really does sound quite different. Now we've also got the vibrato control here. This is a really important part of your musicality as well, overall. Check out what this sounds like. So you can hear there's a really lovely change there between the non-vibrato, the very, very still sound, and the very full vibrato sound. Now for me, this is a really key part of the combination of both of these dynamic and vibrato controls. If you listen to how I might play them together,
Now, it doesn't always follow as well that you have to have the vibrato kind of following the dynamics. That does sound quite nice and it sounds quite natural. But an alternative way is to, um, is to make the stronger, the louder dynamic non-vibrato and the quieter dynamic vibrato, like this. So you can see that that gives you a, a really interesting variation in the color as well. So where does expression come into all of this? Well, I'll tend to use it as an overall volume control. And that means I might be shaping the beginning or ends of phrases, or sometimes using it to just drop the level if the, if the dynamics at the top sounds a little bit too loud in context. But I won't really ride it in that sense of, you know, of moving it up and down the same way that I move the dynamics up and down because it starts to sound a little bit unrealistic. So I'm gonna leave the vibrato set right to the top. And then here are my two controllers. Uh, so it might work something like this. So as you can see, I'm leading with the dynamics um, most of the time, and the expression is just like an auxiliary control. It's almost like a kind of trim control for the overall volume. Um, the dynamics is setting the, the emotion of what we're hearing. So it's like, so it's a, you know, it's a loud, full, nice, big, big kind of sound, or it's a kind of very small, delicate, uh, beautiful, fragile kind of sound. Um, that's the kind of primary control. And then the expression is there to just alter those balances a little bit um, so that you can get your overall track balance. The one thing that um, is important to remember when making, uh, using orchestral sounds like these, or any kind of sound really, but especially orchestral sounds in your productions, don't feel too uh, tied down to the dynamic and the volume that comes out of the patch as a result of that dynamic. It's absolutely normal in all orchestral recordings and I'm talking about classical recordings as well as film score recordings or game score recordings, um, it's absolutely normal for these things to be nudged around and for the quiet bits to be brought up. Um, and that is something that we're probably not always completely familiar with, uh, especially in classical recordings, but I guarantee you it absolutely happens in those as well. So don't worry about that. If you, It's whatever makes it sound good. That's the main thing. Don't feel like you're cheating or you're breaking the rules or something if you're adjusting the volume of things. It's just what makes it sound good and sound right to you. So I hope there's been some useful information in there. Thanks for watching. See you on the next one. Bye-bye.